Hello, and welcome to Can We Build, a series where I take ideas for unusual devices, contraptions, and vehicles, and give myself just a few days to build them and see what happens, and hopefully have a passable, if not perfect version at the end of it. Now, this is the first episode, and for this first challenge, I wanted something that was reasonably familiar to me, but still a bit unique and odd. And so I also thought about having something that has a good, what I call spectrum of failure. What I mean by that is I want something that if I build it half right, it'll half work, not something that's all or nothing. For example, if I went to go and build a model helicopter, say, you've got to get that at least like 90% right so it takes off. Otherwise, it's going to either spin itself to bits or crash and then crash itself to bits. So I want something that I can do like a passable job, learn along the way and have a good sort of iteration of improving myself. So I thought through some things like, well, what do I know that's odd and unusual and that maybe I've seen but never actually been on or touched? And one thing came to mind, and that, of course, was the wonderful, mysterious vehicles known as hovercraft. Now, unfortunately for uh, safety and also my welding not being very good reasons, I'm not going to build a full-scale hovercraft, at least not in this first episode. But I'm instead going to build a miniature hovercraft, one that is reasonably sized, about say like this big by this big, and that I can drive around using standard RC parts and batteries and things like that. Now, it's going to be not too bad. I've got most of those materials here in the shop. You know, we've got some fabric for the skirt. I've got some plywood. It's got some plastic. I have things like these propellers lying around and some motors. But I also have to work out exactly how to build a hovercraft. And while the basic idea is pretty simple, in my mind, you have a big thing that you push air under and it floats. My instincts tell me that making that skirt look and work well is going to be difficult. Um, it's a very functional piece. I already know my sewing is not very good, so that can be a fun experience. But I also don't quite know how the skirt stays attached. Like, is it attached back to the hull? Is there kind of a, a, a rim inside it keeping it in there? And so the first part of this process, as it is with any build really, is to do some research. And so, you know, I'll show you all the stages, research, then some design, then some building, and then hopefully at the end, some testing and some amount of success. But I'm gonna start with the research. So I'm gonna go away, I'm gonna do some research, and then gonna come back probably as a voiceover and then give you some explanations of what I learned and sort of the lessons there. And once that's done and I have a reasonable idea of what I'm building, we'll then move on to design. But first, I need to go and do some searching. So to the research. Yes, it's me, back as a voiceover. So let's go over what I learned in my research. First, as I already knew, hovercraft make their hover effect by pushing air below them to form a sort of cushion. The air is giving out the size of that cushion is what keeps it slightly off the ground and hovering. It turns out though, that you can feed the air into that cushion in one of two ways. Firstly, you can have a single fan that does both thrust and lift and capture a small amount of its air to feed under the hovercraft and keep it hovering. This is pretty efficient. You only need the one fan and there's less moving parts, but it does require complex calculations to ensure capturing enough air and pushing it under the vehicle. Secondly, you can add a dedicated lift fan, which pushes 100% of its air under the vehicle. This lets you easily control how much air you're adding, but of course it means adding a whole second motor. It does seem harder to screw up though, so I've gone with this option. Now, let's talk about the skirt itself. It turns out there's two kinds of basic skirt design. A simple bag skirt, which is easy to build, but only does well on relatively flat ground, and a complex finger skirt, which deals with bumpy ground much better, but is very complex to construct. I am, of course, gonna stick with the simpler bag skirt option here. But within bag skirts, there's two options how you feed air to both inflate the skirt and make that cushion of air the hovercraft floats on. You can opt to feed the skirt and the underside of the hovercraft separately, keeping the two in air intakes separate and allowing yourself some room for adjustment of airflow to each piece. Or you can build what's called a full flow skirt, where you feed all of the air into the skirt and then small holes around the inside of the skirt let that air out under the craft to make that cushion of air. Having read up on both options, the full flow skirt seems like the more reliable option, so I'm gonna go with that. Finally, we need to talk about thrust and steering. Much like an airboat, the traditional hovercraft design has one big fan on the back with an air rudder to provide left and right steering. It's simple, it's effective, but it would mean building a rudder with some servos, and it has a pretty large turning circle. Alternately, you can have two thrust fans and power them at different levels to turn left and right, a bit like a tank. 
it does mean yet another motor, but it's gonna be easy for me to build and it will allow turning on the spot if I make one fan run entirely backwards. So that's what I'm gonna go for. There's plenty more to learn about hovercraft, I'm sure, but those were the major design decisions I found in my research. And with all those research and picked, it was time to fire up a CAD program and start designing. So it's time to come to Fusion 360 here and design the hull. So as you can see, you've got kind of a traditional uh, hovercraft hull shape with a bull nose in the front and a big old hole in the middle to put my lift fan in. Now, my lift fan is in fact five inches across, so I've put the dimension here, the one, two, seven millimeters, and then left a nice little gap between that and my actual space I cut out to make sure there's enough room for the fan to clear and then give myself room to put a shroud around it. I've also placed the rough location of my two thrust fans. Those are gonna be approximately uh, positioned. I'll just screw them on later, but they're here to make sure you can get an idea of where they are and so I can design around them. Now, on the bottom half here, we have sort of a smaller section, and these two will sort of sit below each other and form the plenum, the air space that the air gets pushed into and then pushed out into the skirt. And if you look closely, there are these two sets of slots in the top and bottom sections. Uh, those will be used to space them off and attach them to each other so that I can have them sitting one on top of the other and giving a nice guaranteed about three centimeter gap. Now, I'm gonna use a milling machine to mill this out, and so, I'm gonna do a setup here for a milling machine. So I've got my stock. It's uh, packed pretty tightly, which is quite nice, as you can see here. And then I'm gonna basically give the machine instructions about how to mill everything out. Now, normally I'd love to use just a single milling bit to do everything. But unfortunately, what I have here are several small slots that are smaller than my standard quarter inch milling bit. And so I have to do two different tool paths, one for the big outside cuts, because those are best done with the biggest tool you can, and then one for the smaller tool cuts. So I'm gonna sort of make my tool paths for my bottom big cuts here. Um, you do them on the bottoms, there's no ways to cut down to. And then you can see we have a nice tool path. And then I'm gonna pick my second smaller tool, and then give it its new contours to cut. And as you can see here, I'm picking just the smaller slots in this case. And what's nice is I can then take both of these and add them together and output them either as different files to run differently or as one big thing. And in this final preview here, you can see that we've got sort of the layout of how everything's supposed to look. We've got all the cuts to find and it looks pretty good. We're not gonna be hitting anything. And so we need to go over to the milling machine and get stuff set up. All right, so I've got my plywood I've got my setup sheet here, which I always print off. It lets you confirm the dimensions and the origin point, because if you screw this up, things get pretty bad. So I'm just gonna make sure this is a big enough piece. Oh, it is more than big enough. There we go. So 48 by 48 centimeters is how big this is. This is about 60 by 80, so plenty of room on that. So next is to secure the work piece down. Now, work holding is a big problem in CNC machining in general. Um, I like to use a little bit of a cheat, uh, not really a cheat, which is using double-sided tape. Um, so I have some tape which is very strong, has very good adhesion and stops like lateral movement, but still peels off pretty cleanly when you pull it up um, this way. So I'm gonna get some tape, I'm gonna secure this down, and then we're gonna get cutting. Thankfully, double-sided tape is easy to use. You simply undo it from the roll, you cut it to length, you make sure it's pushed down firmly onto your piece so it's got good adhesion, then you peel off the backing and then you push it again onto your work surface so make sure it really sticks there, it won't move. Once you're done with that, we can get the uh, CNC router going and first off it's going to do the big cuts with the quarter inch bit around the outside, just making all the main pieces there and then once it's done with the big cuts, I then come in and I swap out the quarter inch cutter for an eighth inch cutter. And that's small enough to do our slots, which had to be like three and a half millimeters wide. So the cutter does those and does the slots. We have six on each surface. And then once the slots are done, we can then come back and the machine is finished. And finally, we can peel off the pieces from the base. Now I use a small crowbar, but honestly, you can use anything here as long as you can get underneath it. Once they're peeled off, a little bit of cleanup on the edges and they push together really nicely and make a lovely frame. So now it's time to measure for the fan shrouds. So making sure I got the right height, I then take that and go to Fusion 360 and make a fan shroud. 
Now you can see here, it's got a little nook at the bottom where it's gonna fit into the top surface and not go through it. And also some holes around the outside for screwing in. And finally a motor mount in the middle there to make sure we can mount the motor with the right pattern. Once I've got that, I can then take it, put it into my 3D uh, printer slicer and go about making it printable. So first of all, I need to make, basically orientate it so that the printer can actually make it and fit it on the bed. So do that, push it down so it's a little less high. And then finally, I'm gonna tilt it just a little bit off of upright to make sure I can get supports up to all the pieces that need supports. Once I've got that, I can run the support part of the program, make sure I've got my supports in place, and then I can slice it. I do the same for a thrust fan mount. You can see very similar design, same kind of motor mounting in the middle, bit bulkier so you can hold the thrust fans in the bottom. And then I take both of those files, go over to my 3D printers, pour some resin in, making sure everything's nice and clean. And then finally, I can hit the go button and get things going. The following morning, I come in, remove the now finished print from the printer and pop it off the build plate using a nice flat tool. The same flat tool makes pretty short work of all the outside supports. And then a nice big pair of shears that takes care of all of the inside ones, along with a lot of peeling. Finally, a nice wash in the cleaning bath of pure alcohol and then finally, a little bit of curing under a UV light and it's ready to go. The process is of course the same for all three of the shrouds and I'm not gonna show you all those here. Next was of course making the skirt. I started off by measuring the rough size of the skirt I wanted on the actual model and then went over to Blender to sort of model what I wanted. I took the basic layout of the hovercraft, put it in and then sort of built the skirt around that, basically starting with the uh, profile on the side and then extruding it around the outside to make my final model. Once that was done, I then took that 3D model and unwrapped it into a two-dimensional shape, cleaned it up a little bit in Inkscape, added a few of the air holes to make sure my air would go under the craft, and finally took that across to Lightburn for the laser cutter, where I made sure it was set to cut nylon. Obviously, nylon being very thin doesn't need a lot of laser power. Now, the fabric here is a pretty thin, lightweight ripstop nylon. Um, it is a good utility fabric. I've got a whole bunch of various nylons like this of different thicknesses in the shop. And crucially, it is perfectly fine to laser cut and it is mostly airtight. So in my opinion, a pretty good recipe for both laser cutting and then fabricating. So I'm gonna take this, I'm gonna pop it in the laser cutter. I've got my vectors already loaded in here. We're gonna cut it out and then hopefully, any luck, We'll have our pieces cut out of this in no time at all. Now, thankfully, laser cutting fabric isn't too tricky. You make sure it's flat on the bed, you ensure your air assist and chiller are turned on, and then you get the machine going. And because it's so thin, the laser cutter can really get through cutting the nylon quickly, and it even fuses the edges together so they don't fray. Well, that seemed to work pretty well. I've got some nice cuts of my patterns here. And as you can see with these, uh, little tabs that make up the corners, it's a lot easier to cut these and all the little air holes in one big go. So now it's time to assemble these into more of a continuous piece. I could glue them, I could sew them, probably gonna sew these ones I think, but uh, I'll go over to the uh, desk over there and we'll see which one works better. So I chose to sew in the end, even though my sewing is really not the best of my fabrication skills, but honestly, it was the right choice and much less fiddly than having to glue all those tiny pieces together. So a bit of sewing, a bit of stapling to make sure it's attached firmly to the actual frame. Not super airtight, but again, the whole point of this is getting some airflow out anyway, so it works fair enough. Next, it's time to take the fan shrouds and attach the motors and the fans into them and then take that entire unit and then screw it down using wood screws onto the hovercraft deck. Once those are on, it's time to then connect up the speed controllers and do some basic wiring layout, just using some blue painter's tape for now to keep it roughly in place while I do the initial tests. Once it was all wired up, I then got the battery, again, taped it down just temporarily, and then it was time for a little bit of a hover test, making sure it was good, and then time for the actual on the floor test. Well, I would call that a success. It is uh, very hard to steer, but that's a case of uh, going into my RC transmitter and working out if I can actually hook it up so that, like right now I'm using three separate channels, one for left fan, one for right fan, and putting both forwards. 
pretty hard to balance it that way. It is a little bit unbalanced. I'm guessing the skirt is not entirely symmetrical. Pretty sure there's a hole in the back left of the skirt pushing air out, but honestly, not a bad start. So I'm gonna go pick it up. I'm gonna try and uh, maybe give it a bit more of a shell so it looks nice. And then I think we'll wrap up here. But of course, dear viewers, when I came back in the next day to, as I say, just finish it off, I instead found myself thinking, well, I can actually improve some base parts of this machine. My first improvement was to go and instead of using the milling machine to cut the plywood, I recut the base using a laser cutter with the same thickness to start a plywood. Laser cutters do leave a kind of burnt edge, as you see here, but they do allow for a really good, nice, tight fit and just a little bit of wood glue and a little bit of, shall we say, mechanical assistance, and you end up with a really solid frame. The second thing was to improve the skirt. Now, the old skirt was a little bit too small, didn't get enough ground clearance, and so I took to the sewing machine with slightly improved sewing skills and made a skirt with a few centimeters more ground clearance. My final improvement was to switch out my normal speed controllers, which only went one direction, that was fast or slow, to bi-directional speed controllers. Let me do the fans in forward or reverse. What this means is I can now hook it up so that when I want to turn, I can run one fan forward, one fan in reverse, and make it turn on the spot rather than just drifting left or right. Finally, it was time to actually make the top of the hovercraft and hide all those messy cables, even though they've been secured down a bit. Again, I used the laser cutter with some plywood. This is a thinner plywood, it's a Luon. And then just, again, a simple push fit design, some angled connectors this time to get a bit more rigidity, get that 45 degree angle on the sides that I like. And then just a few wood screws, screwing it directly into the deck. The front's left open to make sure you can get it to the battery. But with that, it was time for the second and final hovercraft test. Well, there we have it, a pretty reasonably complete miniature hovercraft. It's not particularly pretty. Uh, it does at least have the hovercraft shape, which I'm happy about. I uh, wanted to get that sort of distinctive uh, angles on the edge there. But as you saw, it does actually work, um, especially I think using those uh, bi-directional reversible speed controllers for these two thrust fans. That really helps it spin in place and do the tight turns rather than just drifting lazily left and right. So yeah, that's, you know, I think, uh, I call that a moderate success for a build. Uh, could it have gone better? I think absolutely. Could, could it look better? I think it definitely could. Um, I probably might come back and do a second pass on this at some point with acrylic as the main material for sort of the top here and the bottom. Acrylic does look a lot nicer and it laser cuts really nicely, especially, but you do have to pre-cut all your attachment holes and use bolts rather than screws. So there's a little bit more forward thinking there, which, as you saw during this process, I'm often not amazing at forward thinking, shall we say. But yeah, you know, otherwise I think pretty successful miniature hovercraft. Uh, the thing honestly drives quite well, drifts a little bit to the left, but put a bit of trim in my controller and that should be all right. So yeah, I'm gonna call that again, a moderate success for this first episode of Can We Build? So I will leave you with a bit more video of the hovercraft in action, but otherwise I will see you next time.